Hey guys, welcome to my world. Happy Tuesday. A couple things to get out of the way. I have an infection in my mouth, so like the whole side of my face is puffy, so I'm trying to hide it more, so I apologize. And I just don't want you to like stare at it and be like, wow, her face looks fat. So even though I'm fat, but that's neither here nor there. And yeah, so it's like pretty swollen. Second thing I want to address is people have an issue with me rambling. Oh, well, I'm sorry. It's what I do. It's my little niche in YouTube. I ramble sometimes. If you don't like it, scroll past and don't watch me. I don't care. Third thing I want to address is my hair. Since everybody seems to have such an issue with my hair, I would just want to address it like this. Whether it's extensions, whether it's my natural hair, whether it's a wig, who gives a fuck? I don't really know why everybody makes an issue about white girls wearing extensions or white girls wearing a wig. Black girls do it every fucking day. Nobody says a word. And some of the people that have comments are black. So I don't really understand what the fuck the difference is. Why is it like a big issue if a white girl does it, but if a black girl does it, it's perfectly fine. Um, sounds like reverse prejudice, really. It's just what we do as girls. We wear fake eyelashes. We wear fake hair. We get fake boobs. We wear fake nails. Who gives a fuck? So I don't know why everybody's got to make such a fucking issue about it. Drop it already. No matter what, even if it was my natural hair, who gives a fuck? I'm not here talking about looks. I'm not doing a fucking beauty show. So with that said, let me move on now that I got my rambling done for the day. But this is like part two of part one. And the reason I say it's part two of part one is because part one, I had discussed a couple of things on the timeline, but with all the comments I got, and I want to thank you guys, especially uh, Bernard and Playlist, which I still don't know if you're a boy or a girl, but I really like the engagement and it really made me realize how many of you guys are still so far behind on what's going on. So instead of jumping right into part two, I am going to address some of the comments in part one and maybe make it easier for you guys to understand the timeline. So I'm going to start with um, Iricos, who's also Richard McAdam. Which I gave away a secret, but he also does YouTube, and he had brought up a comment about the uh, Avery was a suspect on November 3rd, which is very true. And I did a video on this last year around April. Now, I did spend like an hour trying to find where I have it saved in my files. Yeah, it's not happening. So what I did do is I went back and checked out my videos to see which video it was on. And I did find what video it was on. So if you go back to April last year, there's a video. I'm not talking in it, but I do show the document and I show it like five different times. So if you want to see, you have to go check out my other video. I should, I could probably link it. Um, but I'm not even, yeah, I'm going to link it at the bottom so you don't have to look for it. But you do have to watch it. And it does show the everything that happened. So let's go through the timeline. On November 3rd, Colbin called in the license plate. Playlist had made a comment about him calling in the license plate doesn't mean that he was there. And we had this argument about it. And you know what? He's right. And that is what a lot of people think, that just because... Colvin called it in, doesn't mean it was standing in front of him. My argument and my proof is that, yes, in the law, you have to have a certain level of common sense. Things have to make sense. For example, a cop, when they're doing an investigation, if, and I use this example and I'll use it again, if they're looking in the mud and they see two sets of footprints, one going this way, one going this way, Reasonable deduction will say there's two different people. Now, could it possibly be that the guy that ran this way stopped dead in his track, turned around and went this way? It's possible, but the odds are highly against that. The evidence will point that two people went in different directions and cops use that or detectives use that as a common sense mentality. It's the same thing here. The odds of Colburn on his day off calling into the police department, running a license plate of a person who's not even reported missing yet. They would make no other logic. Oh, and knowing the license plate number. Now remember, this is his day off. He wasn't investigating anything. So in order for him to do this, 
it's reasonable deduction that the car was in front of him. Now my theory, and this part is just a theory, but again, it goes back to basic common sense. He found the car, or he saw the car on the side of the road. He didn't know whose car it was, so he called it in. I don't remember the call exactly, but if I remember correctly, the call happened after she was reported missing, maybe. I don't totally remember, but there was no other reason for him to call it in. So on November 3rd, when he calls it in, the car was impounded to the yard, not to Avery's yard, to Herman's yard, the scrap yard. That is where the car was taken in. The police report shows that the car was taken into custody, not from the Avery yard, and Bernard, I'm getting into your thing, not in the Avery yard, but that the car was taken into custody and gone to Herman's yard. And by the way, I know I'm talking about my hands, so I got myself a fidget spinner, so I don't have to fidget so much with talking with my hands, because I know it annoys some people. So I just sit here and fidget spin. But the car went to the impound yard. It didn't go to Avery's property on the 3rd. That is when they told, um, they wrote in a report that Teresa was presumed missing or dead, and they have the car with, I believe it said, and again, it's all below in the description box, but I believe it said that she had, um, uh, some of her belongings were in the car. This was way before Avery property. Now, on November 3rd, Avery was considered a suspect, was written in the paper as a suspect of a homicide. Well, take a step back there. On the 4th is when Teresa was reported missing, or on the 3rd, either way. On the 5th is when they found the car on Avery's property. On the 8th is when they find the quote-unquote evidence or where they find the key. So please explain to me, and this is all again on the video that is going to be down below. Tell me how the fuck he becomes a murder suspect on the 3rd for a person that's not even reported missing yet. And if she was, and I have my dates a little wrong because I said they might be, even if she was reported missing, they have no evidence yet. Why was he a suspect? Now, again, if you go to November 6th, the cops tell Brendan, and this is in November 6th interview, the cops tell Brendan that she wasn't, that Avery wasn't her last appointment. So if Avery wasn't her last appointment, then how could you make him a murder suspect on the 4th, on the 3rd? So that's another thing that everyone said, oh, the dates are wrong. No, the dates weren't wrong. This is official police record. And again, it's in the video below. Now, Bernard also made a comment about he didn't, couldn't understand the Avery Yard, that nobody said the uh, truck was planted. Bernard, love you, dude. But I don't understand where you even came up with that or where you think I even said that. Because... The police on the 4th, the night of the 4th, took it out of the impound yard, impound yard of Herman's and brought it in the back entrance of Avery's property and hid it on the property. Now, how do I know this? You're going to tell me, and I've said this before and I'm going to say it again, there is no fucking way that I'm going to believe that Avery, who had access to a crusher, who had access to everything. Brendan and Stephen did not commit the perfect crime. They are not smart enough to do it. They are not educated enough to do it. And they don't have enough experience being serial killers to do it. So the fact that everybody who thinks they're guilty thinks they committed the perfect crime, because remember, there's no evidence in the trailer. There's not one fucking hair, and they claim that they cut her hair. There's not one fucking stitch of blood. There's no DNA of Teresa's. There's nothing. Do you want to know why there was nothing in there? I'll tell you why. Because they couldn't get a loan long enough to put it in the fucking trailer. 
but on the outside, that was easy. Putting DNA on a key, that's easy. Putting DNA in a RAV4, that's easy. But getting inside of Avery's trailer to plant evidence with a hundred fucking FBI agents on site, next to impossible. But in the openness, way easier. That's why they didn't plant anything in Avery's trailer. The other thing that was brought up was the bloody rag. Okay, as it's been proven with a bloody rag or dried blood, you can re-wet it. And if you re-wet it, you can smear it. You can extract it from whatever blood there was and put it anywhere. In order to do that, Wendy went frantically, frantically looking for Avery's bloody rag. Why? Why did he need it so bad? Now, according to Avery, he was cut that Tuesday, that Wednesday. I don't remember the exact day, but he was cut. And it was a pretty deep cut, and he showed it. So she went all over the property looking for that bloody rag. Why? Because they wanted to extract it. It's not hard to do. You Police that have all these tools can easily take dried blood and extract it from it. Not only is that fresh blood, that's Avery's blood, and that's clean blood. I strongly believe that when Zellner made that post that said how, um, you know, the blood is coming from a different place than what we thought because everybody thought it came from the vial. Remember here, folks, I said it last year and I'll say it again. I think the blood came from that bloody rag. And I will always believe that until Zellner tells me otherwise. There's no other explanation for it. And I also think it's possible there was a little red paint in it. And that's why it stayed so bright. Because I had a lot of bio, biology experts send me information saying that uh, blood on a dashboard on plastic fades and it wouldn't stay that bright. So I kind of think possibly that blood was mixed with red paint or whatever they couldn't get from the expunging or the extraction, I should say, of the napkin. So they decided, fuck it, let's mix it with a little red blood. This way it's nice and bright. Just an assumption, that's a theory. Um, let me just take a quick look and see what else is, was like really on my mind that people were confused about. Okay, Playlist had mentioned Carmen and if she was buried, uh, hold on. Do, do, do. Oh, that Carmen overdosed. Who or where did she get the drugs? Okay, that's debatable. What I can tell you from John, and this is right from the Bootwell's own brother, you know, Carmen's own brother, is that they never let them really get close to the body. They kept asking questions, and it was like the cops shut them up. The cops wouldn't allow them to ask questions. The cops didn't want them asking questions. It was like, oh, you know, she's in a better place now. There's some kind of drug ring or pill ring that was connected that Kratz was getting the pills from. I'm not trying to come up with a conspiracy theory. What I'm telling you is what I know about Manitowoc. There was some kind of pill thing that there was a pill doctor. I mean, they're fucking in every state, but there was this pill mill going on. And somehow Kratz was getting from the same doctor some, I don't remember, but so, and this didn't come from John. This is like just Matatwak residents, that there was something with the pills connected to the cops, which are connected to Kratz, and which is where Kratz became like this junkie, which we all know was fact, but that's the first story later. So it's pretty interesting, though, how it all ties together. But yeah, they didn't want her anywhere near um, they didn't, like, allow the family to really do anything. The fa supposedly, the rumors were that the cops took care of the body or took care of the funeral. John squashed that rumor because John said, no, my father worked his fucking ass off to pay for that cremation or whatever. The cremation was done at the funeral home of, I forgot the guy's names, but they were owned by uh, two... I really, I'm so sorry, I forgot the names, but it was Teresa's second appointment. How were they connected to Wendy Baldwin? Let's connect the dots. One of the owners of the funeral home was Wendy Baldwin's ex-husband, I believe. Just connect the dots. This is not rocket science. And Wendy Baldwin kept asking a lot of questions. Qu 
questions about Carmen, questions about the funeral. She was a cop. She wasn't investigating anything. I told John it almost made me feel like that she did all that. She was asking all those questions simply because she wanted to know what John knew. She wanted to know how safe John was. Wendy Baldwin, if she's tied in to a lot of these people and not in a good way. And then when she had that burning of the cross, when she mentioned Kratz and I forgot the other uh, cop, the head of Calumet County. Um, I don't know why I can't remember anybody's names, but it's been that long. And it just, it's frustrating as fuck to me that you connect all these dots and they're so easily put together. And I can't for the life of me get how nobody gets them and how people still don't see them or still don't get them. So I think I pretty much addressed everything that I needed to address in this video. Let me double check. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, another one. JD brings up a really good point, which I was going to save for a different video, but since we're on the subject, I'm already at 16 minutes anyway, so fuck it. Might as well just close it out with this, is that the coroner, Deborah Kakatash, and thank you for dropping a name because I forgot everybody's name. She wasn't even allowed to enter the site. What fucking CSI team, like I said in the last video, is not allowed to enter a site? She's a medical examiner. But yet, they find these bones and everything on November 8th. By November 10th, Teresa's pronounced dead already. Close case. In 2005, the materials, the testing materials, weren't even that fucking good. So how the hell is, are they pronouncing that it's her dead in two days? Did they have no other cases then? It, it just, it just point, connect the dots. It's so blatantly obvious. So I hope that cleared up some stuff. And for you newbies, check out my other videos. There's tons of them. I have like 80 videos. And that's all I got for you guys tonight. I won't be making a video tomorrow because I do one tonight. But I promise I'll do one, another one Thursday, which will be part two. And an official part two, not just like part two of part one. Make sure you subscribe. Check out my other videos. And if you have anything else that you can think of, Along the lines of what I'm talking, please leave it in the comments, and I hope you guys have a great night. Peace out.